Hi guys, my name is Jenna Dufresne and this is North Point Plus and we are on episode 133 and I have the amazing, the great, Jake Howard. Man, you went all like P.T. Barnum right there. <laughs> all I need is like the microphone that just like comes down. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies let's and get gentlemen. ready to rumble. We're oh. back. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Palm Sunday yesterday. That was fun with the kiddos. It was so cute. Yeah, I was <laughs> highly disappointed that no kids ran on platform at any point in time. Oh, I prepared for that. Yeah. You did a I, really good job. <laughs> yeah. go. Ruining my fun. You couldn't make any like viral TikToks. I was hoping. Yeah. I was hoping. I thought uh, with Carter being up there, there was like He's no weird. holding back. His, his daughter. daughter. I yeah. thought she was going to be right there. Jamming oh, yeah. Along. Oh, yeah. And I was here for it. I was ready for it. Uh, so way to go. Way to be like good parents. <laughs> Carter and Michaela. Way to be like on it. Yeah. Children's volunteers. What was it? Our Jamie. Not our Jamie. Jamie was yeah. telling me. She was like, hey, like Hazel might run <laughs> on stage. And I was like, mm. Well, you came Watch. down Perry and my kid, and I thought that's that's pro. That's she went, pro right she there. She was like, I'm not walking. Yeah. And I was like, well, do you want to hold a palm? She's like, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, welcome to my everyday. Yeah, there yeah. I woke up this morning, stuck like here. I was like, ooh. Yeah. I, I'm 22. Yeah. I shouldn't be in this pain. Yeah, you're going to get parent arm. <laughs> yeah, that happens. That's a thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I heard that you taught yesterday. I did. What? Yeah. Well, can you tell us a little bit about what you talked about yesterday? Yeah, so we're uh, doing the uh, unexpected series here, um, kind of wrapping it up close as we get to Easter. We still got Good Friday to go and Easter service next week, um, and then we'll transition to post Easter coming up after that. Uh, but so we're talking about all the ideas of what are the unexpected things that Jesus may have said or did that kind of made him Jesus, this polarizing figure. Um, and so we jumped into uh, John chapter 15, and we talked about uh, this analogy that Jesus gave of the vine and uh, bearing fruit, uh, this grapevine, things like that, and how uh, for, for Jesus' time, this was uh, the vine, this idea of a vineyard. Uh, they took it as the nation of Israel um, and kind of being your Jewish heritage. Um, and so Jesus kind of flipped that on his head and he said, hey, it's not about you, Israel, or being Jewish. It's about me. I'm the vine. You're not the vine. I'm the vine. Um, and you are actually branches that need to be connected to me in order to bear fruit. And, uh, and so he says, hey, remain in the vine, bear fruit, all that. And then we kind of talked about what does fruit actually mean. We defined it as uh, joyful obedience and love. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of taking what Jesus described there. I try to summarize it in a phrase, and it's, I think that comes out best as joyful obedience uh, in love. And so what does that look like for us to bear fruit? We, first of all, we get fruit by remaining in Jesus, and then because we get that life-giving uh, flow from Jesus, it produces this fruit that we then give to the world it, that is that love, that is mm -hmm. that joyful obedience to what God has asked us to do in love to the world. So. So you used a great illustration about what it's like to bear fruit for Jesus and him pruning you and him growing you. Can you share that again? Because I thought that was just a perfect the, like the application. Tree. The peach yeah. tree. Yeah. Yeah. Tell yeah, us yeah. about it. So uh, we have that peach tree in our yard. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I did not know what I was getting into when we <laughs> bought a peach tree uh, because it takes a ton of maintenance to make sure that it doesn't like <laughs> fall apart and actually produces good peaches and stuff like that. Um, and what it's turned into uh, this past summer was uh, a, a cool tree that has tons and tons of peaches on it that uh, we can't prune fast enough because they fall on the ground and gophers come from underneath our shed because they've <laughs> taken over our shed and have this wonderful peach tree and garden from our neighbor that they eat from and stuff like that. So it's kind of funny. Uh, but we use that as an analogy because my peach tree actually broke on me um, and I wasn't prepared or know what to do. So we had to mend it back together and then learned all of the things about the weight and how the, the importance of pruning for it and being connected to the base in order to grow fruit and stuff like that. And so for me, it was a really cool visual because I got to live it out. Um, Jesus is talking about a vineyard here. So he's talking about grapes and vines, so a little bit different, um, mm -hmm. but same kind of concept as well. Yeah, that kind of goes into a little bit about uh, our questions for this week. So our first question uh, is a highly debated topic of Calvinism, Arminianism. Mm -hmm. When I was at Liberty, literally, that was what our conversations were. And I was like, can you just not? Yeah, welcome to Bible school. Like once yeah. that concept hits uh, Bible school <gasps> students, it's it's brain wrecking yeah. for a while. Yeah, And then like yeah. three-year-old Christian Jenna walks in and she's like, Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that goes into our question of today. It says, can you explain the difference between James 2.18 and Ephesians 2, 8 through 10? And I'll read the verses. Well, oh, you, you didn't say who sent the question in, and that's kind of an important <laughs> thing on our podcast. If they're anonymous, that's fantastic. But when they leave a name, we read that name. <laughs> My face bright red. Yeah. I had fun with it because I did yeah. not know I was doing the podcast today. Uh -huh. um, J Dog the Minister. Which turned who, in that who was that? Who's J Dog the Minister? May, yeah. Maybe Jenna? my counterpart, my uh -huh. twin, you know. Jenna's doppelganger, <laughs> J Dog the Minister. Uh, 
Yeah, if you want, you can read the verses and then we'll, we'll chat about it. I'm bright red. Yeah, I think okay. it's helpful in podcasts because people are listening, so they can't just pull up those verses always at times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I yeah read go ahead it. and read those. Go ahead. Perfect. So James 2, 18 says, but someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Wait, no, I will show you my faith by my deeds. Mm -hmm. James 2, 18. Then Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Yeah. So like you said before, a lot of people uh, view these verses as, uh, contradictions. So mm -hmm. people that aren't uh, Christ followers, a lot of times will say like, Hey, the Bible contradicts itself. Like, look right here. Some say like, you need to have this work stuff but over here. It says you don't have to have any works. Like what's up with that liar? Um, for <laughs> others that, uh, want to debate, uh, things like Calvinism and Arminianism, uh, they go back and forth, uh, on these two sides of saying, you know, Hey, is this, uh, God choosing us? Is this mm -hmm. faith without work? Like all, all these things that can be a, be a part of it. Uh, the reality is these aren't at odds. Yeah. Scripture doesn't doesn't contradict itself anywhere. These aren't at odds. These are two sides of the same coin. These are two ways of making the same argument in, mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. So you have two different authors here explaining the idea of salvation that comes from Jesus by the works of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Salvation comes from Jesus by the works of Jesus. And then as a result, you are transformed into the image of Jesus to live out your life in that image. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's break that down a little more. James is arguing here when he says, uh, you have faith, I have my deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my yeah. deeds. Uh, James is arguing that if you're connected to Jesus, it is going to change you, and you are going to bear fruit. Right. James is basically saying this idea of, hey, uh, you say you have uh, faith uh, without deeds. Like, I don't see that. Like, yeah. I have this faith in Jesus, and it's changed my life. So for mm -hmm. you to say, oh, I have faith in Jesus, but there's no change in your life, like, right. that's suspicious to me. Right. Um, he's saying, I don't I don't get that. That doesn't right. mesh here. You don't fall in love with Jesus and it not change you. Who right. Jesus is is going to change you. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul calls that becoming a new uh, creature, a new creation, mm -hmm. like all these things in, in his passages later on. And that's what I think James is really arguing here. It's not as much about, like, trying to see, like, you have these works to get into the club. Right. It's not about checking off a list as much as, nope, you fell in love with Jesus, you recognized him as Lord and Savior of your life, mm -hmm. and there's this transformation that occurs in you. The spirit is yeah. moving and he's dealing with all the junk and he's highlighting all the good, like all of these things that are happening in your life. That's what uh, James, I would say, um, is arguing here. Paul's arguing uh, in a very similar fashion that um, after coming to faith in Jesus, not by your own good works, but by Jesus's works, then you begin to change and bear that fruit from Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I think they're both just arguing two sides of the same coin here. Um, you have two different authors describing it in two different ways, but really they would both agree and would say, hey, it's from that faith that you have in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then that transformation occurs in your life yeah. and you bear fruit. You begin yeah. to change and become more like Jesus. You don't become... Uh, like Jesus, and then get salvation. That's not how it works. Yeah. But rather, you have faith in the works of Jesus, mm -hmm. and then that changes who you are at your core, mm -hmm. and then you're going to bear fruit out of that. Yeah, what was it? I was talking with Maddie Conlon. She's kind of my uh, accountability. We talk about like reading the Bible, what we read each week, and there was a day where I forgot what verse it was, but my amazing Logos app Love it, or however you want to say, Logos, Logos. Yeah, yeah. I failed Greek, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> but we were talking about how um, sanctification and how the pruning process yeah. hurts. Yeah. And we I. Have some questions about that here. Oh, yeah. And so we were talking about it, and I was reading my Logos app and what it was saying on one of my commentaries, and it said, God does sanctification through grace. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ooh. Mm, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it was like, oh, through. It's not through, Jenna, you're awful. Here's my rod. Bam! Yeah. It's, uh, hey, Jenna, here's my rod, but here's also my grace. Right. Like, let's prune you together. So goes into kind of our next-ish question. In John 15, 16, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Is this implying that none of us chose Jesus, but he, chose, but he chooses us? Or is he speaking particularly to his disciples here? This reminds me of the questions of uh, predestination. Mm -hmm. That's what it reminds me of. So, yeah. 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 yeah do you want to read the verse? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. John 15, 16. Uh, John 15, 16. Kind of yeah. Oh. It says, you do not choose me, but I choose you 
and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's important anytime we read scripture, right? We go back to the original context, mm-hmm. like what's Jesus talking about there? It's uh, yeah. um, it's the term that is used for that is exegesis. You take out of the text. Um, and so the original context, not just that Jesus is talking to is his disciples. These would be his closest followers, mm-hmm. um, most likely the 12 that are mm-hmm. there with him, um, that have done life with him, have heard his teachings, seen his miracles, all of those kinds of things. Um, and if we go all the way back to the beginning of the story we read in the Gospels, Jesus did call them. He did mm-hmm. choose them, right? He went to mm-hmm. them. He went to Peter, James, John. Um, he went to Matthew. He went to all of them. And he said, hey, follow me. Follow me, follow me, follow me. He's called to them. He approached them and said, hey, here's my offer. Follow me. Come be with me. Learn from me. Um, come under my tutelage. All of those things. He offered for them to follow him. And as such, because they followed him, they are now granted a deeper connection and a relationship as friends, not just as servants. And yep. that's what Jesus talks about here in this passage even more so by saying, hey, uh, you're not just servants anymore. You're friends. Servants mm-hmm. don't know the Father's will, but I've given you all that I've gotten from the Father. We're yeah. friends. Like there's a deeper level of connection. It wasn't based on the merits of the disciple, but rather um, what Jesus did by calling and revealing and mm-hmm. sharing himself with them. And so we see in scripture uh, that some had answered the call, right? Like Mm -hmm. these followers of Jesus, they answered the call here. Some turned away. Uh, You Mm -hmm. know, the analogy of the rich young ruler, Uh, Jesus, what I need to do, get heaven, he's like, sell everything and follow me. He's like, "Eh, pass, right? I don't want to do all that. Um, And then some uh, followed and then walked away. Uh, We'll see that as we continue to read through the gospels. Judas is a good example of those. Um, So we shift all of that idea of what it meant in that context for how it applies for us today. Jesus calls and he chooses us like he did back then as well. He reaches out and he says to us, hey, follow me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Follow after me. Salvation is found in me. Uh, repentance, grace, mercy abound. It all comes from me and from me alone. I am the vine. Yeah. Like, you know, you have to be connected into me. Uh, we choose how to respond. Uh, here Jesus is emphasizing that he is the one that does the work. Mm-hmm. He is the one that makes them friends. It mm-hmm. all comes from Jesus. It's not based on the merits of the disciples or what they were able to do. They didn't do enough good things to achieve friendship status. They didn't level up or I mean, look like at that. literally Peter the day Jesus denied. denies him. Peter <laughs> yeah. denies him yeah. three times, right? right? Like all of the disciples scatter. You know, mm-hmm. John is there, but he's kind of in the background. Jesus tells him to mm-hmm. take care of my mom. So like John's the only one that's kind of around. The rest right. of them are gone and hiding and fearful in that right. time. Um, so it's not based on their merits at all. Uh, Jesus is the one that makes them friends instead of servants, and he's the one who reveals the Father's will to him. This is all yeah. because of the works of Jesus and the gift that he offers to us, that if we have faith and trust in him. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not based upon how great the disciples were or how great we are, uh, but rather it's out of the goodness and the love of Jesus. Um, so I would say if you break that down... Um, there is a piece where Jesus is choosing us and we respond to that choosing. We respond mm-hmm. to that call that follow us yeah. to be there. So he's speaking to his disciples, but it also has that application, I think, for us in that same manner. So yeah. I think, I hope that answers the question a little bit more. If not, you can submit it next week and then uh, Rick will answer. Good, yeah. Good anymore? There you go. Um, so would you kind of say, kind of right yeah. here, what I think I heard you say was kind of like Jesus, you know, chose everyone, whether or not you choose. Is that what you're saying? Jesus offers, either yeah. the follow me is still the same that's out there. So when Jesus says, hey, I chose you, uh, it's not saying that, it's saying that the disciples didn't do anything to yeah. get to Jesus, but Jesus was making the first move. Jesus yeah. is coming out there and saying, nope, I'm coming to you. Right. I'm coming to you. You can't do this on your own. I got to right. come to you and I'm coming to you. I'm offering, I'm putting this all, all this out there. You choose, I've chosen you, now you choose what to do with that. Right. You choose what to do with my offer of follow yeah. you. That's how I see it. Um, mm-hmm. Um, you know, your Calvinist, your predestined, uh, predestined would, would see it a little bit differently. And yeah. You know what? That's okay. Like, right. I, I think ultimately we're making much of Jesus and how we mm-hmm. get there. So you, we can disagree with that. So if somebody's like, no, that's not what that means. Okay, that's cool. It doesn't right. bother me at all um, to, for you to be in a different camp on that. Um, by all means, like, great. Um, if that's how you want to interpret and see scripture, and mm-hmm. we'll celebrate the kingdom together as well. Right. You know, um, so I would say these are small rocks. They're not unimportant rocks, mm-hmm. right? They're still building the foundation and of faith and all those things, but they're not things that uh, we're going to say you can't be a part of North Point or <laughs> kick anybody Never. out or we can't be friends anymore. You go Never. sit on that side of heaven. Never. No, we're all going to get in there. It's going to be great. Uh, so that's, that's kind of my view on it. Um, like you said, I mean, you went to Christian college. It's hotly debated. Uh, yeah. Nominations have broken up. Churches have broken up over mm-hmm. these kinds of issues and those kinds of things. Oh, yeah. 
And, and you know, that's happened. That's a piece of it. But ultimately, uh, when I interpret scripture and I look at it in its entirely, um, I see that mm-hmm. Jesus is choosing us and that he's allowing that offer to be out there. He's the one who's coming to us. He's making the first move, if mm-hmm. you will. Um, but then we respond to that as well. Yep. And we'll get into a little bit more details yeah. of what does that mean here and a few more questions too. Yeah, so you mainly preach in John 15. So mm-hmm. Jesus says, the vines that don't bear fruit are cut off from him. Mm-hmm. Is everyone a part of God's tree? And if they don't accept Christ, they get cut off? Or is this speaking specifically about Christians? Can a Christian get cut off? Is this like losing your salvation? And this is from the amazing Ermit Land Vargas Life Group. Yeah, I can imagine you guys had a great yes. conversation <laughs> yesterday uh, to submit this question in there. Uh, and I love it. So I'm going to read it the verse mm-hmm. this time. Uh, John 15, verse 6 is what they're talking about there. It says, if you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned, right? So Jesus yeah. is, is the analogy here. And how do we take this analogy uh, to mean here? Is this something where you can lose your salvation? All of those things. Uh, so I'll go a little bit back up to, to my peach tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have branches on my peach tree that have never produced fruit. Yeah. Um, they, they popped out. They were shoots that came out, but they've never produced any kind of fruit. Um, why? Because there's a piece of them that is not connected to the base of that tree. Mm-hmm. They're there, but they're not connected. They're not actually getting the life from the tree to be able to produce fruit. And so uh, I'd say that this is in regards to somebody who is an unbeliever. Yeah. Not a Christ follower when Jesus has given this analogy here. Um, fruit is not the test. You don't produce enough fruit to be connected to Jesus, mm-hmm. but rather fruit is the byproduct of being connected. Yeah. So at any point in time, if there's a, a, is a vine or, or is there's a branch coming off from the vine that is cut off because it doesn't produce fruit, mm-hmm. that's just the indicator to show us that this is not really connected to the to the vine. It's not really connected to the life giving because if right. it was, it would have some kind of fruit. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. How much fruit, all of that. We'll get into that in a little bit with some more questions. Yeah. We're like progressing through these here today. <laughs> this is fun. It all lines um, up. But if it's just not producing fruit, it's cut off because it's not connected. It's not, doesn't have the life that's coming from the vine there. Um, it's mm-hmm. a dead branch. It's not connected to life. And so the, I would read this uh, when it's there. I think Jesus' analogy, um, he's talking more about somebody who's an unbeliever than he's talking about somebody who didn't do enough, produce enough, so they are no longer a piece of uh, connected, and so we cut them off. Um, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here mm-hmm. at all, as much as it's the byproduct of saying, hey, you can see that there's no fruit. Yeah, You're not connected. You can go all the way back to uh, what we just talked about with James. Yeah. When James said, you have faith, I have deeds. Mm-hmm. Um, show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. That's where James is saying, like, once again, you can't be connected right. and not have any fruit. And we're going to get to that question, I think, next. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, we'll just go ahead and read it and jump in there if you don't mind. It says, can you be a Christian but show no fruit? Right, like that was another question that we got in here. Can you be a Christian but show no fruit? fruit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want to answer that question the way it's written, and then <laughs> yeah. dive in a little bit more. Uh, can you be a Christian and show no fruit? The answer is no. Yeah, you can't be a Christian and show no fruit mm-hmm. because what you get from Jesus is life giving, mm-hmm. it's transformative. Um, so somebody who says like, "Oh yeah, Jesus is Lord and Savior of my life." Mm -hmm. but there's no change in their life, like nothing has occurred. I have high questions about that, that there is nothing inside of them, that the Spirit, like you don't see any evidence of the Spirit moving in their life. Now, I'm not saying they all of a sudden become... Um, overnight, this brand new <laughs> yeah. person. No, I don't think that's. I don't think that happens. Some people that does. Some people happen, do it. Yeah, right? that is a thing. Yeah, not for everybody, right? Um, but to say like, nope, I don't feel guilt. I don't feel change in my life. The spirit, like mm-hmm. you just don't see any evidence of sp- the spirit, the Holy Spirit right. living inside of them. Well, then no, they don't have that connection. Right, right? they're not a piece of it. Um, now, can you be a branch that needs pruning? Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so the branches that I had on, I would go back to my peach tree the first few years, right? Yeah. Uh, they had the little green things on year two. Um, there were peaches that were coming out, but they didn't mature. Mm. The peaches never matured. Um, and so they didn't produce any real fruit. They were producing fruit, but it wasn't much. Yeah. You know, you couldn't actually eat it, couldn't use it for anything. The second year, or the third year, it came out, and we had about two bags of peaches that mm-hmm. were growing in there. So we were producing some more fruit. Right. And then last year, we had a ton of peaches mm-hmm. that were in there, and we actually had to prune off some peaches that were growing and interfering with other peaches and stuff like that. But you see this growth. That I think that's how most people are in their walk with Jesus. 
right? That there's this gradual growth piece that comes. They're connected and they're producing a little green fruit, mm-hmm. but it's not quite fruit. It's just making some progress and then they right. get to that next piece and you're starting to see even more and it's getting there. And then as you grow and you're more connected to Jesus, you remain in him over time, mm-hmm. your fruit is going to get better. Mm-hmm. I think you see that. Mm -hmm. And along the way, what happens then is that we have uh, this pruning that has to take place here. Um, I lost my spot here. I want to see this here. Uh, Where is it at? John 15, 2. He -hmm. cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit because it's not connected. Mm -hmm. Right? He cuts it off because it's really not connected to the life-giving piece. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Uh, I think this is the healthy portion of us, that as we move towards a life fully devoted to Jesus, there are things in our lives uh, that we are are joyfully obedient in love, Mm -hmm. and it's easy for us, Mm -hmm. right? Maybe giving is just easy thing. You're like, you know, Mm -hmm. like... Right. My heart is with Jesus, and so I am able to to invest in that. And so, man, I, I am giving faithfully. I have recurring giving up because I just let it come out of my bank account, but right. I'm giving sacrificially, I'm giving worshipfully, I'm giving trusting mm-hmm. that God is the one who gives and provides for me. And so that's a, that's just a fruit part of your life, right? right? That is not. But for other people, that's a struggle, mm-hmm. right? That's, that is a place where there has to be some pruning mm-hmm. that occurs for them to get and grow and mature in those areas. Um, there's other things where the Spirit of God is working to remove sin issues, mm-hmm. strongholds, which we're going to get to, mm-hmm. uh, and barriers to help us grow more into the image of Jesus. And the big term for this, you've already said it tonight, today, it's sanctification. Yeah. It's sanctification. It's a process, and the process is messy, and the process <laughs> is different for everyone. Yeah. Right? So it's not a, a checkbox of being able to do things. It's a journey that we're yeah. all on, yeah. um, and we're all moving towards Jesus, and that's going to be a crazy path that we're all going to take at different times, and my path is different mm-hmm. than your path, um, but we are going to get there. So I don't think you can show no fruit, yeah. but I think pruning is a piece to where mm-hmm. maybe you've got little green fruits hanging out <laughs> yeah. right now, right? Yeah. But eventually they're going to grow and you're going to get more and it's Mm going to get there and it's a part of the journey. It kind of reminds me of Judas. Like we talked about him a little bit before. He claimed he followed Christ, but I, when I first was a Christian, I wanted to study Judas. Like that was all I wanted to do because I, my pastor said, there is no doubt in my mind that Judas is in hell. And I was like, well, I'm going to test what you're going to think because I don't want to ever, you know, Yeah. that's my brain. Yeah. Uh, My life group knows that I question everyone. Let's, let's research that everything. Um, and so it kind of reminds me, he claimed that he followed Christ, but his actions was always throughout the gospels were always worried about money. Well, if we do that, then we won't have this. Jesus is like, mm, like, don't worry about that. So I think that kind of, he claimed to be that, but he didn't show fruit in trusting and loving of Christ. Uh, even as a disciple mm-hmm. that he was, he was learning about Jesus, it had no change. He was following Jesus, had mm-hmm. no change. Mm-hmm. And so I think that kind of results to his last action was, that I can get into all that. But so our last yeah. question is Judas yeah. is a fun one though, uh, because some people yeah. would, would argue with you, would be on your camp and they would say, absolutely. Hey, Judas yeah. uh, showed no fruit throughout. Mm-hmm. So Judas was somebody who heard, but it never really right. took into his heart. He never right. really repented, accepted Jesus, mm-hmm. but he followed along and was right. a piece of it. Um, and scripture says, not everybody who calls my name uh, was actually my follower, right? right? Um, others would say, no, Judas was there. Judas was in. Judas right. was following. Judas chose to walk away. Yeah. Jesus didn't lose his salvation. He gave it up. Yeah. Um, he walked away from Jesus and chose other aspects. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have other verses in scripture uh, that I would agree with your professor. Judas is in hell. Mm-hmm. Um, and the disciples were pretty clear on that later on when they talk about um, his body decaying and falling yeah. and all those kinds of stuff and referring to him is in right. that. So yeah. uh, those who were closest to Judas would say that mm-hmm. and did. Yeah. So. yeah. And it was just interesting to think, you know, I think when you were preaching yesterday, I was like, oh, What's my fruit? You know, like I was like, man, I want to look at everything because that's my overthinking. Uh, If you know me, I overthink legit everything. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just my brain. And so I was reading yesterday and to give before we get into this last question, um, it was I was just stressing out about it. I was texting Maddie Conlon. I was like, you're stressing about it, too. And I was like, we're both stressing. Uh, Good. I'm glad you guys left church stressed out. Yeah. (laughs) Fantastic. <laughs> and oh gosh. And all that kept popping in my head mm-hmm. um is first seek the kingdom of God. And I was like, okay. Why is you know, I'm not the best at memorizing scripture. I have like little snippets mm-hmm. uh, in my brain, but I'm like, where is this and why is this keep popping in my head? Through every anxiety, that's what's coming up. And I looked it up. And I think with the sanctification process, um, especially new Christians, a lot of my friends are new Christians are trying to figure this out of what it means. And 
when you're going through the anxiety of, am I producing fruit? Am I not producing fruit? Mm -hmm. I felt like I was like, "Mm, slow down. Just seek the kingdom of God and I will give you everything you need. Mm -hmm. And if you go more into more context, it's people worrying about, will I have food to eat tomorrow? Will I have, you know, clothes to wear? All these things. And so it just kind of reminded me of that, of, you know, worrying about if you have fruit, if you don't have fruit, the sanctification process, you not being a perfect Christian. No Christian is perfect. Yeah, it's hard because yeah. I think a lot of times people that worry about that kind of thing is it's trying to figure out, hey, what more can I do? Yeah. I need to do more. I need to do more. I need to do more. And that's not what Jesus said. Right. Jesus didn't say do. He said mm-hmm. remain. Mm-hmm. Um, now a big piece of remaining in him, that fruit, yeah. that obedience, that doing comes mm-hmm. from remaining in him. Yeah. You don't do to remain in him, right? You're not right. producing fruit to stay on the vine. No, you right. are on the vine, so you produce fruit. fruit. Mm-hmm. It's the byproduct. Fruit is the byproduct of being connected to the vine. Yeah. Um, so if you want your fruit to grow, mm-hmm. uh, which I think all of us that are that are pursuing after Jesus would say that, yeah. it comes from being connected to him. Right. It comes from being remained in him. Um, what does that look like? What does that mean? Uh, man, I think a lot of it, it's a relational thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it is how the Holy Spirit may be dealing in your life for the pruning pieces of mm-hmm. it, right? Um, I think it is being in uh, fellowship and communication with Him. So I think it's prayer. I think it's studying in His Word, um, not just always reading your Word, because that can become a do task. Mm-hmm. I did my devotional. I read my verses. Um, you know, I, I encourage people all the time, even in reading Scripture, uh, you don't have to read the Bible, study the Bible, um, mm-hmm. which can be very different. Um, for some people, that means, like, hey, I'm going to do a chapter a day. And that's good and healthy, possibly, for that mm-hmm. person, as long as it's not a task to check off. Yeah. For others, man, it might be, man, I was just on these four verses for the entirety of the week. That's great. Yeah. Like dive into that and let that be, because maybe that's what the Spirit needs to yeah. go and just immerse you in and be a part of that. Right. Um, I think tr- uh, following Jesus is also a communal thing. Mm-hmm. So this is why it's important. Um, I think being in, in church on Sundays and being mm-hmm. around believers, this is why we push life groups so hard. You go further, faster spiritually in connection with other people. Right. Um, so all of those things is what it looks like to remain. Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to have a constant repentance piece in your life prayer in your life, studying in your life, mm-hmm. serving in your life, mm-hmm. connection with others that are um, following after Jesus, like all of those things is what it looks like to remain. And when those things are happening, the joyful obedience and love, that fruit is going to be the byproduct that comes out of it on the other end. Yeah. You're not the gardener. He is. That's what exactly. That's, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. you trying to fix yourself because there's a lot of good people in this world. Mm-hmm. Like I can easily say mm-hmm. that. Ellen, fantastic gave so much money oprah gave cars you know people give constantly that help but there's no faith behind it Mm -hmm. it's just a good deed and i think Mm -hmm. that's you trying to be the gardener is when you try to control how god is fixing you rather than just remaining Mm -hmm. in it yeah and Mm kind of goes into our last question is can a christian still produce fruit if they are stuck in a stronghold first what is a stronghold again yeah i might not know yeah, a great question. What is a stronghold? First of all, um, a stronghold is more than uh, being in a sin. It's not just a sin. It's not just something that you've done, but this is a sin that has kind of taken captive of your life. Uh, it's a place where Satan has taken a natural desire in us and he has supercharged it to create something beyond our control. Mm-hmm. So this is not just, hey, uh, I have, uh, I did a sin or I have right. this or that, uh, a sin that's going on. No, this is, this is a constant plague in your life. This is the chink in the armor that Satan is consistently attacking mm-hmm. to say like, hey, whether it's your finances, whether it was um, a sexual issue, mm-hmm. whether it was an anger issue, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Galatians 5 uh, has a pretty good description um, that if you read that, I think you're going to pinpoint something to say, oh, okay, no, that that makes sense. Like there's, yeah. there's some sort of area in there that would be could be a stronghold in my life. Um, a stronghold is not going to keep you from producing fruit in Jesus, mm-hmm. though. A stronghold is a spiritual battle going on within you, Mm -hmm. um, but it's not something that's going to stop all fruit from producing in your life. In fact, I would say a lot of people that have strongholds in their life, you don't know Mm. what that stronghold is or that they're struggling with that Mm -hmm. because they're producing fruit. Because you see fruit and other stuff, yeah. but you just don't know about this particular issue. And the reason you don't know about that is because for a lot of us, our strongholds are secrets. Mm-hmm. We hold them close to our vest inside um, because there's shame, there's guilt, yeah. there's worry, there's concern. Like we, we do that. And so we hold that in there. Um, stronghold is not something we get over on our, on our own. We don't yeah. will ourselves past a stronghold. Um, man, it takes confession. It takes repentance. It takes pruning to happen in our life. It takes accountability with having other believers that are there to to lift us up in those moments. You mm-hmm. know, um, you know, talks the Bible talks about um, it's better to travel in pairs than as one because if someone falls, somebody's there to pick you up. You know, we need that, and that's how we get past 
the strongholds in our life. And sometimes they're lifelong, like we're constantly mm-hmm. going back because that's a weak spot that Satan is going to exploit right. because he seeks to kill and destroy and consume mm-hmm. and all of those things. And so um, this goes back to, to pruning. I think it's, it's God working to remove the things that shouldn't be there in our life. So mm-hmm. um, can a Christian still produce fruit if they're stuck in a stronghold? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, the stronghold is just uh, to get past is allowing that pruning to take mm-hmm. place so that you can produce fruit in a different area. Mm-hmm maybe, uh, but there's probably areas in your life that you are producing fruit. Yeah. Um, that being said, I think um, having a stronghold in your life will keep you from producing the amount of fruit yeah. you can and has an effect on mm-hmm. you, um, but it doesn't mean that you produce no fruit. It just means this is an area you got to prune and deal with. Yeah, my sister, uh, I talk a lot about her. One, because I'm just thinking proud of her, um, and I've just I've learned a lot about God watching her so she um when I first met her when I was 18 she was in the middle of her drug addiction mm-hmm. like in the middle like midst of it I mean yeah when she would show up to family events she wasn't she was there wasn't there yeah and so I mean I would pray for a lot of things and and God finally showed up and she got clean but uh she was sober for a few months and somebody came into her sober living and um and had drugs with her mm-hmm. And they they got kicked out because of it, and they left it there. And she found them, and she was like, "I've been clean for a few months." And I saw it, I did it, and I was like, "Hey," and I know fully that will be her stronghold. Yeah, for sure. And I think in in our rooted series, we did talk about like in my life group, not every stronghold is drugs and alcohol, right, and for it's sure. it's hard when my stronghold is I constantly lie, or my stronghold is I constantly overeat, I constantly you know all these things. Um, and I think it is hard as a Christian um, when you are stuck in that stronghold. Yeah. I have a friend going through that right now and helping them figure out of like, hey, you have this stronghold, but it's okay. Like God's bigger than it. Mm-hmm. It's going to hurt, but he's going to prune you. Yeah. It's going to fit. He's going to help yeah. you. Yeah. And I think we see some of those, like we see God dealing with people's strongholds all throughout scripture. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you can see it. I think Peter's a great example of those things. Paul even talks about this thorn in my side yeah. and that God hasn't removed. And um, we don't know what that is exactly. It could be something physical. It could yeah. be a stronghold. Um, we see that again and again, but even the old Testament is full of times that, uh, of strongholds that people are dealing with. Um, and God mm-hmm. is teaching us us lessons through their dealing with mm-hmm. their strongholds yeah. and him working in their life. And sometimes we see like God has uh, people who did the right stuff and allowed God to yeah. come in and cleanse them of those right. things. And other times it allowed, they were destroyed from those yeah. kinds of things. Right. So um, yeah, it's, it's a thing like being aware of strongholds, what scripture mm-hmm. has to say, if you haven't studied into that, if you've been part of our rude series, um, it's become a little bit more of a language. I've noticed at North point where we talk about strongholds, which is a great <laughs> yeah. thing, which is a really cool thing. Yeah. Um, but man, we'd be happy to send you resources to look into that too. Mm-hmm. If you have your rooted book, uh, it's about halfway through there. You can look and read on mm-hmm. so one day devotional as it talks about uh, the whole sin and we have an enemy portion portion mm-hmm. of it and stuff like that. I was looking at that today from this question. Um, so that's a cool thing. Yeah. It's a cool thing. Yeah. 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 Cool. What else you got, Jenna? What else do I got? What was your favorite part about Sunday? Uh, my kids, man. <laughs> my kids coming down waving palms, right? Like we love our kids. So. <laughs> Uh, that's fun, man. I just love any time yeah. we get to highlight our kids. I love our volunteers. Um, it was fun watching them like uh, Secret Service agents like prep beforehand. <laughs> I looked over, my friend Kate McNerney is like over my shoulder <laughs> looking, and I'm like, "What is Kate doing there?" And then I realized, "Oh no, she's doing the kids stuff. Like she's getting prepared for that." Uh, but it was like real quiet, real helpful, yeah. and doing stuff like that. And it's fun just to watch our great volunteers that are down yeah. at kid level and loving on them and guiding on them, and they do such yeah. a fantastic job. And I am incredibly grateful. Uh, for that as I watch my kids and then tell stories and how much they love our volunteers and the difference that it makes and being able to partner with them as parents um, as they're putting these lessons in is a fantastic thing. So it was, yeah, it was really fun to see parents excited. They're like, my kid has been talking about it. They're like, when it like emails before, is it, is it the Saturday? Is it the Sunday? Are we ready? I'm like, we're ready for this. Like, let's go. Yeah. And uh, bringing the Bible to life, seeing that and going back into Sunday morning, um, if you are struggling with the stronghold, struggling if you bear no fruit, struggling with just anything, and you're curious about showing fruit, go watch kids worship Jesus mm. because they have that childlike faith because they are children. Yeah. And they, they're not worried about their mistakes of pushing somebody, pushing a toy, coloring over somebody else's drawing. That doesn't stop them from worshiping mm-hmm. Jesus. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it was cool to see them do that on 
weeks and I saw a few tears and I was like, I'll, I'll cry with you. Yeah. I will cry go. with you. It's super cute. There but yeah. You go. Well, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. We got uh, coming up just a few things to keep in mind. Good Friday service mm-hmm. is this Friday. So you get this podcast on Tuesday. Make sure it's seven o'clock. It's about a 45 minute service or so. It's one of my favorite services that we do. It, mm-hmm. it feels so drastically different. It's a great intertwined with scripture and teaching and worship mm-hmm. all throughout. Um, it's a really cool it moment. It's a somber moment. But mm-hmm. as you're preparing for Easter, uh, man, I would encourage if you can be there Friday, be there. And then we have the three services mm-hmm. coming up, uh, 830, 945 and 11 o'clock on mm-hmm. Easter. Um, be sure to invite some people to be a part of that. Join in on yep. some of that. The 8, 30, and 11 will be the best way to find seats. Uh, <laughs> but if they're at 9, 45, that's all good. You just get a little more cozy. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then Egan. We got Egan, Egan too. House. We got a few more of those left over. I'm taking like seven today. <laughs> and Egan, my neighbors. So they'll be available on Friday, too, if we have mm-hmm. any left over, yes. right? We're getting yes, thin, but we have some. So. Yeah. yeah. You know what's funny? When I first became a Christian, I didn't know why they called it Good Friday. I was like, how is it good? Yeah. You just murdered somebody. Yeah. They were like, well, Jenna Easter. And I was like, but look how bad. And they're like, so I'm like, uh, it's yeah. kind of funny. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I still slip up all the time and call it Black Friday. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's a totally different kind of Friday, but there yeah. you go. Well, yeah. Well, we hope you all learned and got to dive in uh, to the lesson uh, sermon a little mm-hmm. bit more. And we're super thankful for you guys to be here. See you guys this Friday and on Easter and next week. <laughs>